With me, we'll go and see a place called Candid Island. Who needs Candid Island? It's safer at the docks. But there ain't no streams of sodium. No one remembers Flapjack? Oh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I, apparently, I was the only one who had a childhood. Um, anyway, we're going to be talking about uh, delighting users with performant apps. Uh, this is a story by me uh, with illustrations from a good friend of mine, Damien uh, Sinodinos. In the second largest fruit named company in California, Orange Inc., there lived a team of web developers. And that team of web developers was tasked with building an amazing app. They were taking the company's flagship music app and bringing it to the web. This was a challenge that everyone thought was uh, nearly impossible. I mean, the app was pretty cool. Sure, it could load features, but this player was the key highlight. There was gentle animations guiding when things changed inside of the app. You could open up a bit of UI, and you would have some context for where that was coming from. And if you were to go to different songs inside of the app, you get this really nice background change uh, as you go to the next music. Totally a killer feature. The native team was super excited about it, and everyone doubted the web team. But they had this sign in their office that they could have nice things. They knew how great the web was, and they knew that they could also have these amazing features. Maybe they'd just have to try a little bit harder. So the team completed Manfred's uh, Angular architecture course, and they were excited to try out all the new signal features and standalone components, and they went into their sprint, and they coded for weeks, and they had a really nice concept, and then they brought it in to Jess. Jess was the engineering manager for the team, and she wanted to come through the entire app. It was that big of a deal. She took meticulous notes to see where the team succeeded and where the team fell short. And unfortunately, they fell short in the first version. Now, they got the right parts of the app looking, but you'd go to the next song, and there's just a gray background. You'd press the uh, toggle for the queue, and there's no animation guiding context to what's happening. Things just appeared, and you're not quite sure why. And if you would go to play and pause a song, there's no uh, scaling effect. So the app was 80% done, but it was that last 20% that they really wanted to drive home in that made the app unique, made the app fun. So the team took their notes. They took every feature that they were missing, and they went back to their desks, and they tried to re-implement them. First up was Will. Will was the team's senior engineer, and he was tasked with adding this nice shadow to uh, the player queue, and then, or the album artwork, and then being able to transition between uh, a smaller size and then a larger size when the song was paused. Will, being very smart, thought, I'll throw a box shadow on it, and I'll be done in no time. He went on to the material website. He found some box shadows. He added it to the state, and he thought he was done. In fact, he tried to stress test it and had a nice little keyframe animation to see what the shadow looked like. He threw it on a couple testing devices, and it was at that point Will realized a very important fact. Box shadows are jerks. <laughs> um, it's not their fault, they were built poorly. Uh, box shadows actually are terrible for performance. Uh, we'll explain to the team that anytime you have a box shadow, you can actually see any place inside of the app that is, caught, um, is getting repainted by the browser because of that box shadow. Now, the other members of the team were still a little confused. They weren't quite sure what Will was talking about, so they said, let's look at it this way. We have a, we have a web page. It's got a blue background. And then we're going to add a div on top of it, and that div is going to have a shadow. Everywhere the shadow touches, the browser needs to go ahead and do some complex math to figure out, I have blue here, and at this point of the shadow, what should that blue actually be? And then if you have a complex shadow with multiple steps and multiple spreads and opacity changes, 
you're doing all that work to figure out what the blue means. You add a keyframe animation, and you're asking the browser to do that multiple times for every frame of the animation. If you want a surefire way to make your app slow, add a ton of box shadows with some keyframe animations, and your users will hate it. But this kind of three-dimensional view striked an idea in Will's mind. He said, well, if the browser can take this box shadow and think of it in a three-dimensional view, why don't we just get rid of the box shadow? It's terrible for performance, and we know it's not great. So what can we do instead? Well, we'll get rid of the code that we just wrote, and we're going to add a div. It's a glorified div, it's meaningless. It could be a pseudo element, it could be something, but it's encapsulated into a component so it doesn't leak out to the rest of the markup. But we have a div that is going to be position absolute, it's gonna have a transform on it, and we're gonna use a blur, so we're gonna get the same effect. But when we need to scale it, we'll go ahead and use keyframe animation and then just use transforms. The browser knows how to optimize for this, and our shadow animation can be a lot smoother. So Will went back to his keyboard, he started hacking away, started breaking things, and then all of a sudden he pushed to testing, and what did he have? He had a shadow that worked. It wasn't causing repaints, it was fast, it was performant. He was able to get the same effect using a different approach, and it was good for the users. So Will checked off the player, uh, the play pause animation, and he was done. Up next was the team's animation expert, Diana. Diana was tasked with taking that jarring transition between the cue being shown and being hidden and adding some animations to that. She tried, she tried, she animated it once, she animated the player moving to the side, she animated the, 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 the cue showing and appearing, when she tried to mix them together, she realized that, oh, it's a lot more challenging. Started getting real frustrated, and Will, being empathetic towards her frustration, was like, oh, I'm so mad I could just flip this table. And then Diana said, hey, I've heard that term before, flip. She explained to the team that flip animations are actually just a rough guideline for how you should organize your animations, right? You have a element somewhere, space, time, time being now, space being the x and y position, and then you're gonna get a snapshot of that element. You'll go ahead, you'll get the x, y width and height, and then you're gonna cause a layout change and put that element in its last position. Then you're gonna do the same thing again. You'll get the x, y, width, height, and then you're gonna use web animations to construct the idea that that element is actually back into its original position. Then, you can create this uh, sense of motion by just animating from those different values. Now, most tutorials that Diana had read had stopped there. They're like, you understand flip animations, go animate everything. Uh, and she realized it was a lot more challenging than that. So she walked through the team uh, how their animations were going to work. She said, we will have two elements, the player, the queue, and we're gonna go ahead and get their X and Y, and then their width and height. Then we're just gonna toggle a class on the main, on the main uh, parent component. It's just gonna be an active, we're gonna change the layout, we're gonna completely change display options, we're gonna do a lot of things. And then we're gonna go ahead and get that x, y with height and store it to a variable. Now for the actual main player of the app, really all she needed to do was take the x value, the left, and subtract the before value, and then the after value. And then she was able to animate that using her animation library and animate it from the original position to the end position. For the player queue, it was a little bit different, but actually easier. Because they didn't really need to move it across the page, they just needed to scale it in and fade it in. So they could take the before and after values and do some comparison. If the uh, opacity was zero, it should be from zero to one. If the opacity is one, it should be from one to zero. So she was able to take those values, do some comparisons, and then construct a new animation that would say, I'm going to use a from to method where I'm going to scale the element from what it should be before to what it should be finally. So this would be going from a 0.8 to a one, or if it was being hidden, it should go from one to 0.8, and then the opacity would go from zero to one or one to zero. 
They had hacked away. She got uh, implementation together, and then she added it to the code base, and she saw how great it was. She was able to animate the opening and closing of that player queue and provide really good context for what was happening inside of the app. She told the team that because we're using JavaScript to do this, we can actually use media queries and have a completely different animation for device features or for device orientations. So if a user is in a portrait mode, they should have a completely unique animation uh, than what they would have if they were in landscape. Taking it even further, Diana realized there was this thing called the View Transition API. It's totally breaking, uh, brand new, pretty awesome, uh, and she wanted to be able to adopt it early into her project before, uh, before it was standardized. She said, if it's, if it's there, use it. If not, I can delete the code later. But this simplified all the complex animation by just having uh, a declarative way in CSS to animate elements as they move across the page. But with that together, Diana finished the second challenge, and the team was one step closer to being able to ship their app. Last member of the team was a funny little guy named Craig. Uh, Craig was the, te uh, the team's local TypeScript expert, and he was tasked with the most difficult uh, feature to re-implement, those background colors. As you would go through your list of songs, you were able to see that the app actually updated to reflect those colors based on the album artwork. Craig kind of complained a little bit and was like, this shouldn't be done on the browser. This is really expensive. It's going to be complex. Everything's going to have a weird brownish hue for whatever reason. Shouldn't this be done on the API where you can have better image resource uh, analysis? And while Craig was right, the team told him to Quit complaining and just get it done. Craig went back to his desk and thought about images for like a really long time. Like a really long time to where he started thinking about, I mean, what even is an image? And he thought, well, an image is just pixels. And you can think of an image as an array of pixels. And each pixel is an array of RGB uh, values. You have an array of arrays, and you know how to compare arrays. And if you could have enough data and enough time, you could compare an image by looking at every single pixel and every single RGBA value and being able to say, hey, what's the most dominant color here? So Craig got an idea. There's this really cool library called Color Thief. It's an old, older library, but it lets you pass in an image, and it'll try to figure out what the most dominant color is. And then it'll also give you some additional colors. So for their background player, they think, what if we just take all those colors and make a rich gradient in there? Uh, there were a couple of problems, though. One, it wasn't written in TypeScript. And being the TypeScript purist that Craig was, he decided to convert the entire library to TypeScript just for the lulls. So here's Craig happily hacking away, adding types to complex color quantization, and was able to get a proof of concept going first. And it was, it was OK. It got the job done. It would be good for an MVP. But if it was a large image, you started to notice the app slow down quite a bit. And if you were trying to toggle between play and pause and changing songs and doing a lot of stuff inside of the app, well, you started to introduce jank. And Craig got super frustrated. He, didn't, he knew that he could make the images smaller, but then he would lose the quality, and he wasn't quite sure how to work around all of the jank. And he thought, why can't we just take the work and move it somewhere else? And he said, oh, doy, why don't we just use web workers? Web workers were something that Craig really hadn't used before, but was like excited to try them and see what they could do. So he generated a web worker and then had a directive that could attach itself to the album artwork. And then he'd go ahead and instantiate a new worker. This worker would just sit in the background waiting for things to happen and waiting for data to get passed into it. When the album artwork changed, you would call this get palette method that would render the image to a canvas and then get all the pixels, the width and height, all the information that uh, was needed, 
and then would pass that to the worker using post message. The worker would go ahead, crunch some numbers, do some complex comp uh, uh, comparison against all those pixels, and then when it was ready, it would pass that up. So then he could admit an event that would have all that image data and all the colors from that album artwork. Craig went back to his desk. He started hacking away. He was super excited. He had some, some uh, thrash metal playing in the background because that's how Craig rolls. And he was like, hey, what if we got rid of background colors and we just used a canvas and we would render all that stuff, we'd wait for the worker to send it back and we'd have a, a rich canvas and it'd be so cool and it'd be so killer. And of course he said it with an amazing Kiwi accent. Uh, but of course, the actual implementation was fast. It was good. The team was able to get all of this rich contextual information on the album artwork and they were able to have this done in a way that didn't block the actual functionality of the app. And with that, the team was able to solve all their goals. They finished the app, they finished all the missing features, they brought it to Jess, and she was able to give the team a green light to ship it. And the app was amazing. Not only were they able to rebuild the entire UI, but they could play a song, and then they could open up the player and have a rich background that matched the album artwork, that a gentle animation when you would go ahead and pause the music. And then when you go ahead and toggle the cue, you would have contextual information on what was happening. Things just didn't appear. You knew where it was coming from and why the layout was changing. The team left the office that day feeling super accomplished. They, they knew that they could do all of these amazing things they just didn't know that it was going to take a little bit more work. And I thought back to their motto. We can have nice things. And you can have nice things, too. Anytime you are building something and you feel like you can't have a great UI because of performance, think back to these three. They were able to solve their, animation, their problems and have a great performing app. And so can you. And with that, thank you. <laughs>